locusts, from verses of famine in the Bible, to descriptions of destruction in Homer's Iliad, to visions of terror in the Mahabharata, locusts, specifically desert locusts, have historically proven themselves to be a gargantuan threat to human security as we know it. One, not only of a distant past, but also potentially a not too far away future. Locust swarms are threatening the food disaster. supply of the millions. Desert locusts are Thousands eating their way. Crops destroyed. Goes hungry. But how is it that a non-venomous, non-parasitic, non-disease-carrying herbivorous insect has proven itself so problematic throughout history? Well, to properly answer that question, we would first need to understand the very Jekyll and Hyde nature of said creatures. Generally speaking, locusts tend to exist in two different states of being, commonly referred to as the solitary and gregarious phases. And whilst in the solitary phase, the creatures tend to live, as advertised, a relatively solitary lifestyle, completely inoffensive to any human beings. It is at the gregarious stage of existence, however, that all problems begin to crop up or more specifically, how this turns into this. But how exactly? Well, like any other insect, locusts tend to go wherever the food is, which usually equates to quite a large amount of space. Unless, in the case of a weather-induced drought in which food supplies begin to turn scarce, thus forcing a series of locusts to conglomerate together in pursuit of the limited food supplies that characterize said times. An issue that isn't necessarily problematic due to low locust reproduction rates. Nonetheless, it is closely coupled with a correspondent wet period in which locust behavior begins to drastically alter. As the creatures become increasingly social, reproducing at rates that exponentially increase the size of the overall population. The swarm eventually finding its way to human inhabited farmlands where they forcibly consume everything that they see. In the process, producing mass displacements and possibly even famines within many of the very food insecure nations that make up some of the globe's most locust vulnerable regions. So that's why locusts are so problematic. But this of course begs the question, can we do anything to stop them? Well, the short answer to that is not really, because once locust numbers reach problematic levels, there's in truth little that can be done to mitigate the issue other than to spray chemical insecticides, most of which being both environmentally and ecologically harmful into the land and air. This in truth being nothing more than a damage limitation exercise, as albeit being a necessary evil, only ultimately serves to slow rather than stop the onslaught. So essentially, a locust plague is a force of nature that can't really be controlled. However, this isn't to say that all hope is lost. And to properly understand why, let's take a look at my car insurance policy. This is a very long and convoluted legal document that I barely understand myself to be honest. But to summarize it as simply as possible, this is a document that is not only reactive in nature, but also preventative, meaning that not only does it specify what is to be done in the case of an accident, but also, and potentially more importantly, what is to be done to prevent that accident from occurring to begin with. So how is this relevant to locusts? Well, because by all indications, locust managers actually have quite a lot that they can learn from insurers. Because unlike insurance policies, locust management policies tend to be almost exclusively reactive in nature. The approach being to ignore the issue during quiet periods, otherwise known as recessions, and then to only begin paying attention to it once it's completely impossible to ignore, throwing huge amounts of money at the problem in a desperate attempt to solve a quasi-hopeless issue, an approach that completely ignores what is undoubtedly the most effective element of locust management, prevention. This means that a much superior alternative to our current approach would be to throw small but consistent funds aimed at preventing plagues rather than large but inconsistent ones aimed at managing them once they're already in truth completely impossible to manage. An approach that would ironically wind up proving a lot less expensive than our current inefficient one. So if locust management were to be led by insurers, it would probably look a little something like this. But how feasible are these conditions? Well, let's try go about tackling them one by one. 
Condition 1. The insured agrees to implement anti-locust frameworks even during quiet periods, otherwise known as locust recessions. Locust infestations tend to be categorized into four different stages of severity. First, a recession, which refers to quiet periods, then an outbreak, which refers to the beginning stages of an infestation, as locusts begin to gather into small group spans and swarms. Then third, at the upsurge phase, things begin to get a lot more troublesome, as locusts begin exponentially reproducing and migrating in pursuit of food, until, if not properly managed, the locust infestation reaches its fourth and final stage, the plague phase, in which a series of regions are adversely affected by locusts over large periods of time. Now fortunately, the latter two are in fact the least common occurrences of locust behavior, as since 1860 there's only been about 10 upsurges lasting somewhere between 1 and 4 years, and 9 plagues lasting somewhere between 1 and 22. This means that time is essentially on our side when it comes to the preventative aspect of locust management, and that if all the proper institutions and frameworks are put in place, the damage that locusts are capable of can be drastically minimized at worst and completely nullify that best. However, to properly understand how to go about achieving this, we would first need to understand the ecological causes of locust behavior. Condition 2. The insured agrees to pledge a large amount of resources to manage locust populations during closely corresponding extreme weather periods conducive to locust growth. As already alluded to, locust gregariousness is intrinsically linked with extreme weather conditions. For example, the desert locust plague that hit the Sahel region in 1986 and lasted well into 1988 was preceded by a long period of drought in the 1980s, followed by heavy rains that hit the Sahel region in 1985 and 1986. Whilst the most recent 2020 upsurge that affected mainly the Horn of Africa and Western Asia is thought to have been predominantly caused by two cyclones that hit the Arabian Peninsula in 2018, followed by heavy rains in India, Pakistan, Yemen and Iran. Then, another corresponding dry period, followed by a cyclone that hit the Horn of Africa in 2019, thought to have been the final straw to have ultimately triggered the outbreak. So, given that locust problems are easier to predict through set events, it would of course makes sense to use weather-based predictive models to prevent locust plagues. However, in reality, this is actually a lot easier said than done. The main reason for this being the sheer amount of land mass that needs to be covered. Mass that ranges from the Sahel region to the Horn of Africa and even into areas of Western Asia. A gargantuan amount of space that's overall management is anything but a simple task. Which brings us to Condition 3. The insured pledges to carry on investing money and resources into the development of important technologies that may aid in both preventative and reactive efforts even during quiet periods. And this is where specialized technologies such as supercomputers, satellite systems, and bioinsecticides, each of which being both tried and tested, may serve to ease this burden somewhat. In the recent 2020 locust upsurge, for example, supercomputers were utilized in Uganda to gather data regarding soil moisture to better predict future locust movements, while satellite systems such as the EUMESAT Sentinel Tree System and NASA's Cyclone Global Navigation System were utilized to quite effectively map out locust populations. However, the most exciting technological advancement in this regard undoubtedly lies in the bioinsecticide realm. In the past, essentially the only method for dealing with locusts was through chemical insecticides, which, as we already mentioned, served to not only harm locusts, but also crops. Bioinsecticides, however, bypass these issues almost completely, as technological advancements in this regard lend towards finding methods for harming only locusts and not necessarily the crops that they consume as much. However, However, technological advancements in this regard is unfortunately often inhibited by the aforementioned lack of care for the preventative aspects of locust management, bioinsecticides being the perfect case study in point. In our current free market economic system that works based on the principles of supply and demand, bioinsecticides make no economic sense to produce considering that there is no telling when the next locust plague will be. This means that when said bioinsecticides are in high demand, i.e. during locust plagues, there's practically no supply for them since their production obviously takes time. This means that funding for said technologies should ideally stem not from the private sector but from the public one instead, that isn't subject to the same laws of supply and demand, and that can continue working on said developments even during locust recessions. Which now brings us to potentially the largest inhibiting factor facing locust managers, 
politics. Condition 4. The insured agrees to do everything in their power to address political issues that may inhibit locus management. Said issues relating to, but not exclusive to, money, corruption, the lack of education, state instability and conflict. The first issue in this regard being that of money. Somalia, Yemen, South Sudan, Niger, Mauritania, Besides constituting some of the globe's most locus vulnerable regions, said countries also share another similarity. Economic struggles that often render them completely unable to properly fund their own anti-locust institutions and frameworks. The desert locust plague that hit Western Africa in 2003 and lasted well into 2005 perfectly encapsulates this problem. With the related Food and Agriculture Organization report claiming that of the four frontline countries, Chad, Niger, Mali and Mauritania, only the latter is said to have had the proper institutional frameworks in place to combat the crisis, with the other three leaving them either understaffed or staffed with people holding on related expertise. This means that the aforementioned small but consistent funds should ideally impart stem from richer donor countries, which in itself may seem to be a problem considering that said funding may be perceived as an act of charity, and often a heated point of contention politically within said countries, especially by those who believe that said funds are better utilized internally rather than for foreign aid purposes. However, even if humanitarian arguments aren't enough to sway said critics in this regard, it should also be kept in mind that in our very interconnected world, it is highly unlikely that problems in Africa and Asia aren't going to eventually be felt elsewhere in the world, which in the case of locust problems is likely to lead to an influx of irregular migration, another very heated point of contention politically within said countries. I mean, if someone doesn't have anything to eat, they're almost certain to migrate where they wind up being anybody's guess. This factor likely being the reason why richer donor countries tend to fund anti-locust programs nonetheless, as evident for example by the 2020 crisis in which a series of funds began flowing in from a series of richer countries such as the US, Canada, a series of EU countries, Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and more. However, with said funds being provided exclusively for reactive programs, which as we already mentioned makes no economic sense. This means that said countries should be more willing to fund preventative programs instead since they make more pragmatic sense. However, even if this were the case, this nonetheless produces a very tricky dilemma in this regard. And to properly understand why, let's take a look at this list. This is Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, where at the bottom of the list we find a lot of the globe's most locus vulnerable regions. Somalia, for example, one of the hardest hit countries by the 2020 crisis, lies dead bottom of the list, with the equally affected Yemen lying only 4 places above it at 176. In light of this, one can therefore understand why richer donor countries are often apprehensive to fund potentially nefarious governments with no strings attached. This problem likely playing a role in them traditionally preferring to fund international institutions instead that are usually less corrupt than their national counterparts. The most prominent example probably being the United Nations as Food and Agriculture Organization and other regional organizations such as the Desert Locust Control Organization for Eastern Africa. Africa, or DLCOEA, successor to the now defunct Joint Locust and Bird Control Organization, known by its French acronym of Ocolab. Now, on paper, this method may actually seem to be quite an effective alternative to the national approach, if not for the fact that said organizations are, similarly to their national counterparts, endemically underfunded. The most consistently funded organization, of course, being the FAO. However, the FAO's remit for handling desert locusts is in truth a very limited one considering that they're responsible not for on the field operations, but instead for acting as a centralized support unit for affected countries. Meanwhile, regional organizations more directly involved on the field level have a very limited track record of success, as evident by past monitoring failures that are often attributable to member states failing to pay their respective fiscal contributions. Thought have been one of the primary reasons why the crises in the Sahel in 1986 and Western Africa in 2003 wound up becoming as problematic as they did. And whilst this chronic underfunding and miscare for regional organizations is obviously a massive problem, it's in truth a rather understandable one, 
considering that said organizations were, during colonial periods, utilized by colonial powers to override the sovereignty of their colonies, thus fostering a lot of mistrust for them, even on a grassroots level. In light of this, it would probably make a lot of sense to invest lots of money towards challenging this perception. This can be done by funding both national and international institutions, but in the case of the former, doing so under the condition that a chunk of said funds are utilized for educational purposes. A proven method for dealing with issues of both corruption and false perceptions. Meanwhile, regional organizations from their end should do more to promote nationals of affected countries to leadership positions and to be more involved in civil society so as to foster more trust for them on the grassroots. But this now brings us to potentially the largest inhibiting factor facing locust managers. In a war that has lasted decades, recent military offensive against the fighters on the military side is pulling Somalia down. and neighboring countries. Destruction is immense. You see, the drought prone, rough, and sometimes uninhabitable terrain that makes up some of the globe's most locust vulnerable regions is often a rich breeding ground not only for locusts, but also for conflict and state instability. Less than ideal conditions for locust management, which of course requires lots of cooperation on both a national and an international level. And while these issues alone may seem to be a massive headache to contend with, they in truth only constitute the tip of the iceberg in this regard. Because in addition to conflict causing the deterioration of international relations and state instability, they also serve to render the job of underground locust management almost impossible to conduct due to safety concerns that seem to endemically haunt these areas. For example, the decade-long period before the 1986 crisis was preceded by civil wars in Chad and Sudan, a war of independence against Ethiopia and Eritrea, a war between Mali and Burkina Faso in 1985, conflict in the Western Sahara involving Mauritania throughout the 1980s, and that is only scratching the surface, especially when considering the sheer amount of of micro conflicts within areas that potentially served as fruitful locust breeding grounds. Similarly, the recent 2020 crisis was preceded by years of conflict in heavily affected states such as Somalia and Yemen, many areas of which being under the control of terrorist organizations which underground locust managers understandably refuse to cooperate with. Thus, however, rendering the monitoring of potentially vulnerable areas completely impossible. A gargantuan issue considering that certain studies show that only the inability to monitor 5% of vulnerable areas is enough to render all preventative efforts completely useless. Now obviously, the issue of conflict is, for the most part, a completely inescapable one. After all, one of the only constants of human history is war. Or is it? Because despite all the aforementioned conflicts, trends from past reactive programs seem to highlight that even the most bitter of enemies can sometimes cooperate with one another when the luxury of conflict is no longer available to them. Though admittedly, this would require a gargantuan mindset shift in the manner in which we do both international relations and conflict management. A Herculean task which, though profound, is nonetheless necessary, especially if we hope to survive the coming threats from not only focused but the general era of climate change. So what do you think? Should a more insurance-based approach be utilized to solve these problems, or is there a better method for going about this? I'd really like to know what you think in the comments, so please comment below. And whilst you're there, why not subscribe and hit the notification bell to be alerted of future videos.